Hello everyone, my name is Nicodemus with the NPC Gaming Group, and I will be your host today for the history of Nintendo. Nintendo is one of those rare companies that helped shape an entire industry. Without them, the landscape of the video game market would be very different than it is today. With their iconic characters and legendary games, they've made a huge impact on literally millions of people across the world. As we excitedly await the launch of Super Mario Odyssey later this month, I wanted to take a closer look at the history of Nintendo and their 128 years as a gaming company. Nintendo was officially founded on September 23, 1889 by Fusahiro Yamauchi of Kyoto. He obviously wasn't developing video games back in 1899. Instead, the future CEO of Nintendo made a living selling playing cards called Hanafuda to the Japanese Mafia. The Yakuza ran illegal gambling parlors in the seedy underbellies of cities and provinces across the whole of Japan, and because the government had banned out-of-country imports, the Yakuza would often need new playing cards for gambling games. So when Yamauchi set up shop, the Yakuza took an interest in locally sourced playing cards that wouldn't have to be smuggled into the country. The Hanafuna had hand-painted designs on tree bark that Yamauchi would have to do by hand. So of course, as demand for the Hanafuda increased, again thanks to the Yakuza, he had to hire new assistants to produce more inventory. In 1949, his business had grown so much that he filed for registration with the government and became known as Nintendo Karuta. But across the world, they were simply known as the Nintendo Playing Card Company. In 1956, Hiroshi Yamauchi, grandson of Fusahiro Yamauchi, came to the United States wanting to form a partnership with the biggest playing card developer at the time. When he saw that they were running out of just one small dilapidated building, he began to realize the limited potential of Nintendo's products. Hiroshi then decided to try out a number of different business ventures to increase the company's revenue. Nintendo set up a taxi service called Dea, a TV network, a food company, and oddly enough, even a love hotel which for a lot of reasons makes me laugh. By 1966, all of the ventures had failed to earn the company money. On top of that, playing card sales were down, which made Hiroshi seriously consider closing Nintendo's doors for good. Seeing the writing on the wall, and knowing that if nothing else was done, they'd soon be out of business, Hiroshi made one more desperate bid to move into another market. And that market was the Japanese toy industry. In 1965, Nintendo hired a man named Gunpei Yokoi to maintain the assembly line machines in the Hanafuda factories. When Hiroshi Yamauchi came down to the factory to think, he saw Gunpei playing with an extendable arm toy that Yokoi had developed during his spare time. Instead of being angry that Gunpei was literally wasting time building toys on the job, Yamauchi took it as a sign and asked him to make more for the Christmas rush. Later that year, Nintendo released the Ultra Hand, which the children of Japan absolutely went nuts for. Gunpei went on to make a few other products over the years, each one as successful as the last. The 10 billion barrel puzzle, a miniature remote controlled vacuum cleaner called the Chiritori, a baseball throwing machine called the Ultra Machine, and the Love Tester. But despite Nintendo's amazing success in the toy market, they just couldn't keep up the demand for their products. Competitors Bandai and Tomy had the resources and the factories to mass produce toys on the market, and Nintendo unfortunately did not. But the toy market had been very good to them, and in 1973, seeing some of the successful arcade cabinets beginning to spring up over the world, Yamauchi decided to switch over to the video game industry. Gunpei Yokoi was promoted to the position of Nintendo product developer, and he followed a very unique philosophy of game design, known as lateral thinking of withered technology. Withered technology in this case refers to technology that's cheap, thanks to an oversaturation in the market. Lateral thinking implies finding new, creative ways to incorporate that technology into something unique. Yokoi's design philosophy was that games, and thus Nintendo itself, didn't need to be at the cutting edge of technology. The novelty and gameplay were the most crucial elements of good game design, and all of his products were made with this in mind. 
They first wanted to start out seeing what their competitors in the market would be offering, so they secured the rights to distribute the Magnavox Odyssey in Japan in 1974. By 1977, Yokoi began to experiment with new hardware, starting production on the Color TV game home video consoles. To help him produce the Color TV home video game consoles, Nintendo had hired a few new people to work under him, including a young student product developer named Shigeru Miyamoto. Gunpei Yokoi took the young Miyamoto under his wing and taught him that the lateral thinking design philosophy that he incorporated into his work is an important part of game development. Most of the early games they made, however, were clones of more popular games and thus didn't get much exposure when they went to the States. They literally broke even on all of the arcade consoles that they had made. And it wasn't until 1981, when Shigeru Miyamoto designed the Donkey Kart arcade game, that they began to see some measure of success. Customers went, and I'm very sorry for this pun, absolutely bananas. And it went on to change the company forever. The success of Donkey Kong gave Nintendo a huge boost in capital and led to a few licensing opportunities for their game. Every console publisher at the time wanted Donkey Kong exclusively on their platform and were willing to pay a hefty price for it. Donkey Kong became one of the most popular and sought after video game arcade cabinets in the world. And although many people playing the game hadn't realized it at the time, they had just caught a glimpse of Nintendo's future mascot, simply known as Jumpman. In 1979, Gunpei first began to play with the idea of making a handheld video game console. While on his way to work, he watched fellow bullet train passengers waste time with the LCD calculators, which could play rudimentary games, but unfortunately nothing very exciting. He began to think about how nice it would be if they had a game, something fun to entertain them as they traveled. And that's when he came up with the idea for Game & Watch. To support his new idea, he wanted the controls at the time to be pretty self-explanatory. He didn't want to preclude anybody from gaming, he wanted everyone to be able to enjoy it. And after a few design prototypes, he came up with the idea of the cross-shaped D-pad, which had pretty universal inputs. Press down for down, press up for up. Adding this to the future iterations of the Game & Watch, released a year before Donkey Kong, made it a thriving success. And with the added capital of both Donkey Kong and the Game & Watch portable consoles, they were able to shift their large revenue stream into the design of a home console, incorporating all these elements together. Once they'd started production of their new video game console, which would use Gunpei's design philosophy, work began on securing more titles for the future release. Yokoi worked alongside Miyamoto on the development of a new game, based on the character Jumpman, who had been introduced in Donkey Kong. They were having trouble deciding what kind of game they wanted, and it wasn't until Yokoi suggested it might be fun for Jumpman to have some superpowers, like being able to fall from any height without injury, or jumping without injury, that they settled on the idea of a multiplayer action platform game. Miyamoto was at first skeptical about the ideas, thinking that the invincibility would make the game boring. But once he programmed it in, the design choice became a prominent part of the fun. Jumpman still needed a name, though. Something catchy that people would remember. Fortunately, at Nintendo of America, they had solved the problem by getting yelled at. As the legend goes, a hot-headed Italian-American businessman named Mario Segal busted into Nintendo of America's rental space and started demanding his late rent money. After being pacified by a promise of payment, Mario left, slamming the door as hard as he could on the way out. The design team at Nintendo of America decided to immortalize Mario in their new video game as a memento to the earlier financial struggles of the company. Jumpman, whose identity was now that of an Italian-American plumber, was renamed to Mario in Sigali's honor. Though the game Miyamoto designed wouldn't have much success in the States, thanks to the video game market crash of 1983, 
It proved to be an important milestone in the company's history and an important first step into their eventual success. In 1983, Nintendo launched the Family Computer, which became known as the Famicom in Japan. Instead of licensing the characters for profit on other systems, they would use the exclusivity of their titles to pull people to their consoles. A cosmetically different version of the Famicom was released in North America, and it later became known as the Nintendo Entertainment System. By 1985, the video game market in America was beginning a resurgence, and quality titles, which the whole family could enjoy, were in huge demand. And that demand made the NES a huge success in the States. A few years later, Gunpei Yokoi expanded on the original work for his Game & Watch consoles, creating the new Game Boy handheld system. The portability of the Game Boy, along with the ability to change out cartridges, made it a smashing success. Nintendo of America President Manura Awakawa even managed to include the popular game Tetris in a bundle with the Game Boy, which contributed largely to how fast it sold in the States. In favor of full-color displays, which many competitors were using at the time, Yokoi wanted to emphasize the battery life and longevity of the console, and it proved to be the right choice as consumers would carry them everywhere. Thanks to Gunpei Yokoi and a young Shigeru Miyamoto, Nintendo became a worldwide phenomenon. Their philosophy for game design and the timing of the video game crash of 1983 gave them an exclusive run of the market for a number of years. Business was thriving, and they would continue to innovate over the next coming years, producing higher quality consoles and expanding their list of iconic characters. But they would soon find themselves with a few new competitors, hoping to get a share of that market and put Nintendo out of business. 